Hello, everybody in the tech track. Hello. Hello, everybody in the tech track. Wait, pretend you're awake. <laughs> pretend you're awake. All right. How does it feel, Mr. Cameraman? It's your turn. You're a star. You can be on my blog in 24 hours. You feel good about that? And believe it or not, this is nothing compared to what Google's doing to you right now. Everybody, good. Everybody feeling good this morning? Yep. Yeah. All right, this is the cloud. You are the cloud right now. You're going to be up on my website. You're the cloud. Who knows what the cloud is? Who thinks they know what the cloud is? Because I'm going to tell you you're wrong. You. What do you think the cloud is? You don't know? All right. Who thinks they know what the cloud is? Sure. What's the cloud? Uh, technology that allows you to not care as much about the neighbor that you're on. Wrong. Okay, who else, know, who else thinks they know what the cloud is? See, it's a trick question, right? Because I'm going to say wrong to everybody, and I'm, you're a good sport for even doing that. It's great. My name is Jeff Hardy. Tony, next slide, please. My name is Jeff Hardy. I work for Server Silo. Server Silo is the division of Paragon Networks. We're a big hosting company. We host a lot of .NET sites. What the heck do I know about the cloud? Why should you, Mr. Handlebar Mustache, why should you even care about what I say? I've been around this business for a long time. Before I worked at uh, Paragon Networks and Server Silo, I worked for a company called Smarter Tools Software. Smarter Tools Software sold software to tons and ton thousands and thousands of hosting companies. Millions and millions of customers are using our software on the cloud right now. I've been published in major technology journals. You don't care. I've given presentations at Webmaster World. You don't care. I've given presentations in South Africa about cloud structures bringing the cloud to South Africa. And really, you don't care. All this is just to say, I know a little bit about what I'm talking about. So we're going to be talking today about the cloud. I, why? Why do I say death to the cloud? I say death to the cloud because people are killing it right now. And we're going to talk about why people are killing it, why it's important, why you should care, and where it's going in the future. Next slide, please, Tony. All right, what the heck is cloud computing? Cloud computing is a collection of methods and methodologies and technologies that allow you, or should allow you, this is what the definition should be most of the time, should allow you to access the technology when you need it just in time, where you need it. You shouldn't care about where you are and what you're doing. The cloud should be instantly available across multiple platforms. That's not where it is right now. That, however, is what it someday will be. We have to find a way right now, the whole world is finding a way to kill the cloud as it's been defined. And we're going to talk about why that's important. Next slide, please. Okay, first thing is the cloud is freaking everywhere. Everybody's got the cloud. Why? Because the cloud's a buzzword. The cloud is the next paradigm shift. The cloud is the next cutting edge technology that everybody wants to buy. People are spending more money for things that have just been rebranded as the cloud. It's like taking Coke and saying now you are new Coke. Well, it's still Coke, right? You put a new label on it, it doesn't change the product necessarily that's on the inside. So we're going to talk about that. Everybody's doing it. Google's doing it. Amazon's doing it. Microsoft is doing it. All the major hosting companies are doing it. Why? because everybody thinks that they need it. Who thinks they need the cloud? You think you need the cloud? Who thinks that you, you go over there? You think you need the cloud? You can, you can I do? But see, that's tough, because when I asked you what the cloud was, I had three people raise their hands. I had six people raise their hands when they say that they need the cloud. You need it because you've been told that you need it. Now, I'm a proponent for the cloud. As I said, I've been published and presented on it, there are use cases. There are people who need the cloud. There are people who need it right, right now. And there are different people who are going to need it in the future. But the key is, not everybody needs it. So why does everybody think they need it right now? What's going on in all of our brains in the technology world that's convincing us that we need the cloud now? Why do we feel that? Who knows about the Gartner hype cycle? Okay, now more, a lot of hands, hands are starting to pop up. This is something that Gartner came up with. You know, Gartner is a big corporate consulting firm for IT, and they charge people hundreds of thousands, not millions of dollars, and then tell them what to do with their own watch. But they do come out with some good information every once in a while. They've stayed people, and they came up with they saw this kind of thing that happened in technology. First, it was internet, and that gave us the first internet bubble. When everybody thought everything was going to be, everything in the universe was going to be, your life was going to be on the internet, and you're, you're going to get bridal gowns, you, everything, forget this, this building, who needs concert halls anymore? We're going to have concert halls on the internet. Everything's going to be there. You don't need buildings anymore. Of course, that wasn't true, right? It wasn't true. We need this building right here. We're in this building now. They said, 
bricks and mortar is dead. Buildings are, you don't need buildings anymore. Everybody's going to work from home. The truth of the matter is that was mostly hype. So they started following these things. As technology goes through, every technology, every new technology has these phases as they identify them. A technology trigger. Something happens. Something changes in the world. Somebody invents something. Steve Jobs comes along. Something happens and something changes. And then you have what's called the peak of inflated expectations because everybody believes it's going to save the world. Right? Yes. Think about it. It's part of our human nature. It's what we do as human beings. When we first meet that great chick in the bar, we think, she's the best. She's awesome. She's, she's my freaking soulmate. But when you sober up, <laughs> right, you get a little dose of reality. So this is called sobering up. You fall into the trough of disillusionment. All right. Every technology has follows this curve in some way. Sometimes it's a little higher, sometimes it's a little lower, but they follow this, this path. After the trough of disillusionment, a slope of enlightenment where you go, wait a second, wait a second, perhaps there's something really of value here. What is the core value in that? And then the plateau of productivity. That happens later on when people really figure out how to deliver value to people from the technology that was devised. So let's kind of see about this. Uh, uh, Gartner takes and they, they do these, they charge lots of money for these reports. I may or may not have friends who have given me possibly access to this. So let me confirm and say, is anybody from Gartner here who's going to sue me? Good. Next slide, please. This is from 2010. I'm going to walk you through this a little bit. This is the hype cycle for what they call emerging technology. There's lots of dots on this. It's, it's, it's a big mess. It talks about everything from extreme transaction processing to big data, all these things. All of them are fascinating topics. We're talking about the cloud. Let me come over here and point. See the arrow? Cloud computing. In 2010, they were saying it was reaching. It was just cresting its peak of hype. Everybody wanted cloud. I didn't see commercials. Have you seen that commercial that's out right now? We are cloud is built in bedrock. It flies through, and, it, and also you rise through this building, and they come. We are the upper net. You seen that? <laughs> Great commercial. I wanted to buy their product, and I think it's bullshit. Okay, but okay. So here it is: cloud computing, cresting. Go next slide, please. This is their the Gartner hype cycle for 2011. Has not progressed much. They thought it was still at the peak of its hype, and it was. But where are we today? Next slide, please, Tony. We're on that downward slope. We're following in that, 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 that disillusionment with the technology. Why? Because people realize they're buying Louis Vuitton purses. They're spending a lot of money. Anybody have Louis Vuitton? I don't want to take anybody off who, who likes the product brand. Good. All right. Because there's a, an intrinsic value in cloud computing, and the hype has been exceeding the amount of value that it can deliver to people. Right? People are spending lots of money. I'm picking on you, aren't I? It's terrible. You, you feel bad about that? You good? All right, just make sure, because it, it's the mustache. I just keep looking down at you. It's a crazy thing. Okay. <laughs> Pe people are taking and they are, have this expectation about how cloud's going to save them all this money, make their life redundant, make it so that their servers are never down ever again. And I can be in Bangladesh, I can be in Bangkok, Thailand, or I can be in Berlin, Germany, to extend the B metaphor. I can be in all of these places, and it doesn't matter, because I'm in the cloud. I'm no longer confined by the restraints of physical servers and data centers. I'm better than you, sir, because I'm in the freaking cloud. The problem being is that every cloud structure today, every single one of them is built on the same technology from 10 years ago. Every cloud is a series of clustered and servers who are linked together to provide a certain measure of redundancy. Sometimes, sometimes things are labeled as cloud, and it's no different at all. You still have a shared hosting account sitting inside a virtual machine inside of another server. And you are no more safe, you are no more protected, no more redundant, no more global than you were yesterday. But you're paying a few bucks more for it. Because the cloud has become a, a, a catchphrase to sell you more and to make you feel good about what you buy. Now we as technology professionals, we like to think we're not susceptible to that. We like to think we're above that and beyond that we can't be fooled. The truth is we're human beings. 
Yes, we've not been made Borg yet. Resistance is futile, we will have chips eventually, but we just don't have them yet, right? So we are susceptible as well. So let's talk a little bit about, next slide please. What are the details? When clouds fail, we're gonna touch on this quickly. When clouds are wrong, what, who benefits who should and who really needs a cloud? Let's talk about these one at a time. When clouds fail. Now, contemporary, now eventually, where we're going, let me take a little bit of futurism here. <laughs> we're going in a direction. We're going in a direction to true grid computing. It's 10 to 20 years away. Best, in the most optimistic of estimates, we are 10 to 20 years away from that. A grid would be like you get your power, just like you get your power. You don't know where your power comes from. I was born and raised in Phoenix, Arizona. We have you know, great power supply there, right? The people in Los Angeles don't know they buy most of their power from us. Arizona Public Service uh, sells power from the Palo Verde Nuclear Power Plant. It's the largest nuclear power plant in the world. And it sells power to Nevada and to Southern California. They're sitting at their home, they plug their toaster in, boom, and they have no idea that that power is coming all the way from, from Phoenix, Arizona, because it makes no difference, we're part of the grid. At some point in the future, the technology will be invented to truly have a grid cloud, where what data center you're on doesn't matter, what OS you're on does not matter, what application you're using does not matter. We are not there yet. No matter what anybody tells you, we're not there yet. But we're on our way there, but we're still 20 years away. So when do clouds fail? Who heard about the big uh, Amazon failure about last month? It was huge, right? You have an entire eastern seaboard down. What went wrong? At, what went wrong with Amazon, in my opinion? Anybody from Amazon here? <laughs> Good, because I don't want to be sued. I'm really worried about being sued, right? I, you know, okay, so so it, it, what happened with wrong with Amazon, in my opinion, is they were managing their cloud structure, surprise, for their benefit, not necessarily the benefit of their customers. Clouds fail whether they are interlaced uh, 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 network nodes or they're interlaced computers fail when they are overloaded. I'm gonna give you a specific example that we can all understand. Who has ever been bumped from a flight? <laughs> About half of us. Who has ever seen somebody else get bumped from a flight? <laughs> Why does that happen? Overbooked. Overbooked, okay, now. Airlines are making a calculated bet. They manage the load on their airplanes for? Profit. They're on, no, don't say profit. Profit's not a good thing or a bad thing. Profit just is. It's a measurement of, uh, of efficiency. They manage it for their own benefit. It's an important way to say it. They manage it for their own benefit, okay? And their benefit is a full plane, no empty seats. So they know, they know that a good measure of the people in the world, a little bit flaky. They're gonna make their reservation, they're gonna print their border pass, they're gonna check in the night before online, and then they're not gonna show. They're not gonna show. I know you do that all the time, you blow people off, right? They just don't show up. So if they have a 100 seat plane, they sell 110, 115 seats, because they know on average, 16 or 17 people aren't gonna come for their flight. The problem happens when they do. And it is a mathematical, so anybody, any, any math majors? It is a statistical certainty, that, and they know this, that a certain number of flights, a certain number of flights, people will show up. On a certain probability, one in 100, one in 80, some number, they know they're gonna tick off some passengers. It's going to happen, and that is a risk they're willing to deal with. What happened with Amazon is they had a failure in one small node. But what they did is they sell, they, they sell over capacity. They say you have availability of four gigabytes of RAM. Four gigabytes of RAM. But what they're telling you is that that's not RAM that's reserved for you. That's RAM, you're, that's RAM out of the pool. Because they know statistically, not all their customers use all their RAM at the same time. Statistically, their customers don't all use all their CPUs at the same time. They don't all use, you have this much bandwidth. They sell more bandwidth than the physical size of the pipe because they know statistically that their customers do not all use all the pipe all the time. They normally use something less than that. So for all the protestations about this big elastic cloud, you lose one node in the, in the middle of a couple of customers spiking, clouds fail as they are currently designed to do. They fail. 
because these things are being maximized for the benefit of the hosting company, not for the customer. Okay? So, let's talk about the, when the clouds are wrong. When are clouds wrong? Everybody right these days says, I need to be in the cloud. I want to be in the cloud. CEOs, CEOs who cannot log into their email without their secretary helping them say, the cloud, because it looks really good in that quarterly report. And they want to get on there as fast as they possibly can, right? But when, when are clouds wrong for you, all right? Clouds are wrong for you if you are not elastic yourself. Why do you need elastic pants unless you're planning on putting on weight? <laughs> yeah, I gotta laugh at that guy. Laugh, laugh, laugh out loud, people will be encouraged. Okay, <laughs> it, you, don't, you don't need them, right? Most people, we, we run, we're part of Paragon Networks. I got a lot of stats. With my history in the business, I have a lot of access to a lot of information. We look across this, our customers, thousands of servers, they use CPU 10, 12% on a continuing basis. When they're doing a big process, they spike. But if they're ever using more than 80 or 90% of their processor at any given time, I know something's wrong with their system. They've got a problem in the code, they've got a memory leak, they've got something going on, we're gonna help them fix it. Most of the time, you don't need to expand. When do you think, let's, let's, say, that, let's say that you're somebody, let's say you're, you have business X, right? You have a website, who's got a website? You've got a blog, too, right? All right. Let's say that, you got a blog, right? Yes. Okay. How many visitors do you get in your blog? Uh, very few. Yeah, I know. I know. But how, uh, what, dozen, two dozen, something? Yeah, I can go around that. Okay. If you were on a server, how many visitors in a single day do you think you would need before you exceeded the capacity of a single average server? Okay. You are off by a logarithmic number. Let me ask you this. How many visitors do you think, if you were hosting a, an ad, a web ad, that was linked to a major bowl game, how many servers do you think it would take to handle the load? Anybody? Good guess. I've heard higher numbers even. You're off by a factor of 100. It takes three. We do it every year. We've got a couple customers who host ad, do ads at major bowl games every year, and the entire amount of traffic, they spend millions of dollars on this ad, and the, all the traffic they generate does not even come close to maxing out the three servers we set aside for them to host it. All right, so the point being is that I am not aware at the current time of any business model that exists, that is expanding at a rate that would outstrip the ability to add a physical server to the node. I am not aware of that business model. Now you can take and find, probably find me one. I'm not saying it does not exist. But I can say with great certainty that 99.999, of any business any of you want to start or host can be hosted on physical devices effectively, redundantly, and cheaper than paying Amazon or Microsoft or Cisco or Google to host it for you in the cloud. Right. You don't need it. It's wrong for you. It's the wrong solution. Okay? Next, who benefits and who should? We touched on that before. We touched on that briefly before. Who benefits right now from the cloud? Right now, the cloud is being used via hype. Anytime, so I, had a, I did a presentation one time and I said, the value of any incumbent offering is inversely proportionate to the amount of money spent on hyping at minus one and expressed as a percentage. That means the more you hear somebody talking about something and hyping something, the less good deal it is for you. If they're spending millions of dollars and rebuilding websites to promote this, that costs money because they're going to get more money, more money from you if you do it. There's no other reason that they would. The more somebody tells you how great they are, the more you should run away from them. Right? Greatness stands on its own. In the technology world, in the hosting world, everything's the cloud. I'm a heretic these days. I'm a proponent of the cloud, but I'm telling you that, geez, guys, not everybody needs a steam shovel. You know what? Sometimes you just need a pickup truck. 
right? But the steam shovel, it's extensible. I can dig any size hole I want. Are you gonna build the Grand Canyon? You don't need a steam shovel. You need a shovel and a wheelbarrow. This is where you are. But they're gonna sell you that steam shovel if they can get you to pay for it. All right, now, who really needs a cloud? It's a great question. My favorite example is FEMA. FEMA, okay? Federal Emergency Management Authority, FEMA, national. Hurricane blows, you don't know when it's gonna happen. You get like four days notice when a hurricane's gonna strike land, right? And they start tracking it and then they cover it. It's moving 10 miles an hour. Now it's moving 11. Now it's moving 11 miles an hour. No, 12, no, no, no. And here, sir, we have, we have a puddle. We have a puddle here and obviously the rain's coming. You know, they wanna hype it for 17 days. When you're FEMA, a disaster strikes, earthquake, tornado, whatever, your traffic goes from virtually zero to millions. Millions in, in a day. It's the perfect environment for a cloud. Let me give you a more uh, pedestrian one. This is, I think, is viable. You're the Oscars. They have a couple of hundred visitors to their Oscar site on a daily basis, but then they have millions when they release the candidates, and they have tens of millions on Oscar night. It's a perfect environment for a cloud. But let me tell you what they need. They need to run their website from a single server for nine months out of the year, and then push a replicated node out to the cloud for three months. That's what they need. Even they don't need the cloud all the time as it's currently designed. Thank you very much, Dusty. I got five minutes. I'm right, on, I'm right on schedule. Yes. Okay. So, that said, all I want to prove to you, my only goal in the 25 minutes that I've got to complete this presentation is the cloud's great, the cloud's awesome, the cloud's wonderful. But I'd be willing to bet money that nobody in this room needs to be on it today. Eventually, you will be. And if you think you're on it now, you're not. The, te the, the type of serving technology that you have today that you're using that makes you think you're on the cloud, whether it's your wonderful, geez, wonderful, amazing mobile devices, iPhones and Apple Macs and all these things, they make you think you're on the cloud. You're using apps, you're getting software as a service, great web apps. These things are all wonderful and new developments that are pushing us towards the cloud. <laughs> But all those apps are running on real individual servers in real data centers to, the day, to this day, 99% of the time. Most of the time, it's not even failed over into a web farm. Most of the time, you're on a single server somewhere in Omaha, right? Okay, last slide. Okay, my name is Jeff Hardy. This is my Twitter handle for the company, Twitter handle for me personally, there's my email address. I'm always available. If you want to throw <laughs> rocks at me, make sure you do so but make sure they're really small rocks. Does anybody have any questions about the cloud? What about the cost? Say what? Cost, efficiency, besides the purchasing. That's a, it's a great question. Server having to set it up. It's a great question. Yeah. Can we talk about and cost for a second? And update it, that kind of stuff. Right, yeah. yes. Yeah, there's, uh, so there's a couple things. First of all, server silo, yeah, we, we do servers starting at 99 bucks for a real server, right? But, and that's you know, fully patched, fully updated at that time when you get it, right? So, so there, there are those things, but you can get some of those benefits from a shared hosting account or from a managed hosting account in a VPS somewhere. The cloud extendability, the problem being is that if you pay for all that, all the cloud hype, right, there's, they still have guys managing that server, they still have people managing the network, they still have that, that service there, that level here. But you have to understand, you probably don't need all that extensibility. You just need a defined hosting plan. And you need it set up so that if I find out that I'm reaching the limit, if I ever get to the point where I'm reaching the limits of my capacity, I want, I want to be able to upgrade. I am not aware of anybody, including all of our brands, Server Silo, Power DNN, AppZone, not aware of any of them that will not, with a phone call or an online click, let you upgrade your service that fast. And they can even send notifications to you to let you know you're maxing out your resources. I have one time for one more question if you got it. Why is Netflix not right for the cloud? Yeah, that's, that's a, that's a, first of all, that's a great question. Probably, I, I would say, uh, they're streaming video, right? It's a very specialized, very specialized environment. They're right for their a private cloud. Their technology is so specified 
they shouldn't be on the same cloud as everybody else. They should be building their own internal private cloud, right? So, there's that, so that, meaning that that's, you're gonna have, they're gonna have each rack is gonna be a self-contained powerhouse that's drawing a, a, on, a, on, a, on its own database and its own super redundant 96 terabyte sand store. It's gonna be a private cloud just for them. But in reality, their model is exceptionally predictable. It should be anyway, right? Mm -hmm. You think every time somebody clicks in, they know how many they know how many videos that gonna, people on average are going to see. But they control it, right? You can have one at a time if you're streaming it, and three DVDs at a time at the most if you're just sitting to you. Are they screwing it up? Yes, because I think they're over, I think they're pushing their servers too hard. I think I think that they're over allocating in their private cloud. They're doing the same thing the hosting companies are doing, like Amazon did. They are trying to say they're trying to put too, too little headroom in their in their in their private clouds, which is what they currently have. Does that help? Thank you. Appreciate it. Have a good show, guys. Bar camp.